Hi everyone, welcome to Only Connect, a markloves.com podcast. My name is Brad Elliott, founder of Platinum Seed and Continuum. Every month, I'll be speaking to top business and brand owners about what matters to them most. This month, Alyssa Pretorius of Uber Eats chats to me about how data and AI can unlock customer centricity and brand growth. Thanks so much for taking the time to talk to me. I know that we've met before and actually spoke alongside one another, so it's cool to chat again. An absolute pleasure and um, excited to chat a little bit more now. We've teamed up with uh, Mark Lives, which is a marketing website, very much in the yeah. advertising and media space, uh, to do a series of 12 interviews over the next 12 months um, with CMOs, marketing directors and CEOs about what keeps them up at night and just trying to pick their brains and get some insights. Nice. Obviously, a lot of the questions are focused around data and customer centricity. How marketers and businesses can start using data to enhance the customer experience. So if this is so obvious, if customer centricity is so obvious, why are so few businesses truly embracing it as like a leading principle? In terms of like feedback that we've had from our restaurant partners, in terms of speaking to some of the third party partners that we have already as Uber Eats, I think there's two big problems. One is the data actually isn't that accessible. Mm-hmm. Um, and so as Uber Eats, we're really lucky. We obviously have an application that means we can follow data you know, at every step of the transaction from a customer. And that allows us to get real, really deep insights. Um, and so the, the first thing, I mean, it was really surprising to me how little detail the current POS systems in South Africa actually provide mm-hmm. to restaurant partners. So mm-hmm. basic stuff like stock management actually doesn't exist in most POS systems. And it's crazy. I mean, that was quite surprising uh, for me. So I think the first thing is, does the data actually exist? Mm-hmm. Um, and the second thing that I found is the idea of using data um, in a very smart way means that you you kind of need to be very clear on what your objective is and what your outcome might be and how deep you want to be in an investigatory world. So kind of, do you want to decide that all I want from my data point is to drive new sales? Um, And to do that, you need to get really deep into segmenting the data, thinking about the data in different ways and letting the data talk to you. What I've found is very often um, when people have a ton of data, they go very um, high level mm-hmm. and, we're, and and so they're not getting the deep insights that really can drive customer centricity. Yeah, I mean, listen, uh, from my experience, I think you've hit the nail on the head with those two problems because it's what we experience with our clients as well. Quite simplistically, it's not something that we've been, our generation has been taught really mm. in terms of how to deal with this kind of big data. I'm seeing trends within the industry of more and more people investing in basic things like data data analysts within their organization, business intelligence, um, like uh, functions within their orgs. I'm seeing restaurant partners coming to us and asking for more and more data and getting more insights um, into kind of whatever knowledge that we have and trying to figure out how to use that and really tap into that. Um, and I think it's it's a natural progression of where we have to go, right? Like if you, it doesn't make sense to take a big risk when you've got a ton of data that will help you mitigate that. And I think people are coming around to that idea above and beyond the customer's interest to opportunities. There's access to data, which is one problem. Um, but yeah. obviously the other problem is once you have the data, everyone's sort of just taking this high level view. But it seems like from there, you're seeing quite a bit of skills development and people up hiring and upskilling. But I've always wondered if as businesses, uh, they either just don't understand the value that data can extract or give them because, as you said, they don't have a clear objective, whether it's it's just laziness. So, I mean, for me, the technology exists to like segment and deep dive into data. Do you think, do you think change management or is actually quite a crucial part, getting people's attitudes to change towards data is, is more of the problem than the technology itself? I think there's a piece as, as, uh, that companies need to think about in terms of how are you incentivizing people? So are you thinking about new sales, mm-hmm. attracting new markets, um, building an organization that's thinking in this way so that people are kind mm-hmm. of incentivized, not necessarily financially, mm-hmm. but just in terms of how they're measured in their performance, yeah. um, to think innovatively and in, with an entrepreneurial mindset. I'm not convinced people are lazy. I'm <laughs> convinced that I think it's more they're not clear on where to even begin. Yeah. And I think, um, you know, you, you think about how people perceive 
people who data analyze and you you imagine a bunch of geeks in a room mm. who look have old computer screens and are writing weird um, data queries yeah. and i think that's a it's quite intimidating yeah um so i think it's, it's more an intimidation factor than a lazy factor so who do you think are like the top thinkers on custom centricity both locally and globally uh, uh, after Ubi yes Eats. of course um, no i mean that aside yeah <laughs> I'm not sure if I if I can talk to a specific company that I think is doing this well, yeah. but I think the companies that are using tech to speak to their consumers in the way that their consumers want to be spoken mm-hmm. to mm-hmm. are the guys who are the most forward thinking on this. Mm-hmm. So it's the guys who are smart enough when you leave your cart to send you a Facebook message to say, hey, did you have an issue? Is there any way that I can help you? Or it's the guys who are thinking about WhatsApp shopping um, because they understand and identify what their consumers um, need and want. I think the people who are perhaps uh, maybe not being customer centric, but are definitely using data in a in a very strong way and are, are thinking through behavioral economics and the way that they're building mm-hmm. loyalty to their platform. The guys mm-hmm. that I I kind of get inspired by are um, Discovery Vitality. Okay. Like what they're doing in South Africa is is the kind of one of a kind in their industry mm-hmm. in terms of using data to identify consumer behavior, identify how you can change that behavior yeah. and identify very clearly what makes a consumer tick. And I think that kind of mentality, they're probably for me, the leaders in thinking um, on how to actually speak to a consumer in a very specific way. I agree. I think they're doing a great job as well. And I mean, listen, I think... I'm obsessed with my Apple Watch. I went for a run this morning, no. even though I had no time just to make my exactly. point. Exactly, and that's the thing. So, like, we talk about uh, data and customer centricity, and everyone sort of defaults back to personalization, which I think is really important, obviously, um, and meeting customers where it suits them best. But if you yeah. talk about true behavioral change, if you look at uh, like Vitality and, and Apple Watch and points, like, it's not even, for me, it's not even about them debiting an amount of my credit card for the Apple Watch anymore. It's an obsession to make sure I reach my goal and my points. Um, so it's almost like the stick, the stick has fallen away. You know, oh my word, if I don't reach my goal, I have to pay for my watch. I think they've really think, actually changed that yeah, behavior. I think that's where they've, they've totally done it right in terms of balancing that carrot and a stick. Yeah. Because I don't feel like I'm penalized. And, and, and this, they've been very specific about this and they've experimented a lot mm-hmm. with figuring out the right mechanic here. Mm-hmm. Um, but it, exactly to your point, you, I actually don't yeah. know when they charge me to my bank account or not, yeah. but I certainly know that I've got a leaderboard with my family. Yeah. I don't want to make sure I'm the one who, <laughs> who doesn't get their points for the week. Yeah. Um, you know, and you're kind of, I'm doing, you know, all sorts of health checks and assessments that I would never do as someone my age, yeah. um, just to get a couple more points on the board. So um, I think it's, I think it's really exciting what they're working through and, um, at the moment. Yeah, and I think maybe to your point as well, um, your point earlier around data and like sort of this, this perception that it's a bunch of geeks sitting in a room with all computer screens. I think maybe that was the type of data we used to have. We used to have really dry, demographic, non-behavioral data, right? Like a snapshot of, uh, of a person in time. But with you know, the rise of digital and technology and channels and platforms, the amount of data we can get on behavior, like actual behavioral data, is so massive that maybe that's why companies haven't really woken up to it as quickly as they should have. I think a number of companies are starting to think about it. And they're the guys who started to think about data um, a little bit earlier are the guys who are starting to do things a little bit differently. Um, but I also feel like there's been a long time where we've had basic data and people just haven't looked. Mm. And it was just because it wasn't done um, and it was okay to just do things based on whatever consultant or marketing company advised. Through data, you can really understand people and their behavior. And I think if you use that correctly, you can really build trust with them, right? And once you yes. do that, you're actually able to transcend into verticals and businesses that you may have never thought of. So if you take Discovery as an example, I mean, they were a health insurance business. They now are basically a full financial services business, and they'll probably transcend into other verticals soon as well. So, I mean, it really does give you the competitive advantage to not only 
dominate in your existing vertical industry, but actually go outside of it. And that sort of speaks to your virtual restaurants and dark restaurants as well. If you think about some of the things that Uber's done in terms of obviously sitting on a ton of data, um, we've built a product called Uber Movement, and I think it launched two years ago almost now. Mm -hmm. But we sat on all of this data, which showed how people were moving around cities. Yeah. And we realized city planners desperately wanted to understand this um, mm -hmm. because we have that by time of day and where is their starting point and mm -hmm. how are people congregating? And you can imagine how much a city planner values understanding right. what happens on a Friday at two o'clock in the morning and what do I need to do to make sure that the city is adequately secured, the roads are okay, where are the roads being um, used more and more? And Uber actually open sourced this um, mm -hmm. And, and, and people are using this to, to get to deeper understanding of their cities. That's I think like if you think about it from an Uber Eats perspective and you think about where the world is going in terms of um, understanding their food a little bit better, figuring out mm -hmm. salt content, figuring out sugar content because of the current rate of obesity, mm -hmm. does a platform like Uber Eats start to become a information sharer um, more than just a place for you to order your food but provides you the kinds of information that you need to make the right decision making when you're eating um, and, amazing, and yeah. by, by the same token does uber eats become and and this is not on our roadmap to be yeah. super clear but um i just think the world is limitless with some of these things yeah. and i think there's a, there's a lot of experimentation going around globally as we start to understand consumer behavior a little bit better and i think when we talk about customer centricity it's it's putting the customer first but it's also about getting a deep knowledge of what the customer is actually looking for yeah. and making sure that you're continuing to provide that and innovate against those uh, insights. Yeah, and I guess that's why the most innovative companies don't mind making their data open source because they gather more and more and have more and more insight into people, which they can then obviously, <laughs> let's be honest, we're in business for, for profit at the end of the day, but then they can use that down the line to, to sort of further understand their customers and obviously increase customer lifetime value and build that relationship. Yeah, and I think what's interesting if you look at the tech industry, if you look at the the um, leading kind of technology companies in the world mm -hmm. at the moment, I actually would argue that they're definitely motivated by profitability because everybody needs to um, needs to get there yeah. if you're going to be a business. Yeah. But I think the the fundamentals is figure out a consumer need, solve for the need and you'll make a viable business model well, um, yeah. versus maybe some, uh, some of the older school thinking, which is like, let me make sure that I'm profitable from day one. And that means I have to make adjustments to my service offering um, unnecessarily to fit a financial model. Would you be comfortable in telling me who you think is losing in this field? Who's losing in customer centricity? It doesn't have to be one there, company. It might even just be an industry. Actually, the, the adoption of available data that I'm seeing happen a lot less, a lot slower than I've anticipated is actually with our restaurant partner base. I feel like this, the industry in South Africa is not using data as quickly as it should. And it's interesting in South Africa, if you look at Cape Town versus Joburg, mm. um, you know, if you just started basic stuff like trends, like how mm. quickly is our Cape Town restaurateurs adapting to trends in, in global food trends versus mm. Joburg is, and then similarly, when you start to see changes in consumer habits, how quickly are we adapting? And, you yeah. know, another good one is the gross, the grocers in yeah. South Africa and the retailers yeah. in South Africa. Those are the ones I was going to bring up. Yeah. How have we not thought about? I mean, Amazon is is massive. Um, virtual shopping and on-demand mm -hmm. shopping is is something that is definitely a movement. We understand how how much more precious time has become, mm -hmm. and, and you know, this is what makes Uber Eats a success. Mm -hmm. And I feel like. Um, in South Africa, some of our retailers have just been a little bit slow to to adopt some of the insights that they definitely have. Yeah, I mean, that, and that's for me was my number one go-to, and I'm on record for it as Woolworths. I mean, like, listen, ShopRite and them, I can sort of give them a bit of leeway because their target market or their, their typical customer doesn't, well, that's maybe an assumption, a bad assumption, but in a way doesn't part with as much data. They've definitely got a lot of insight yeah. for sure, but it's not like your Woolworths customer where you're tracking a card and multiple touch points. So, yeah, I think retailers are really underinvesting in, in sort of uni-channel approaches as well. Think about how long we've been offering credits through um, retailers mm -hmm. to consumers. So, like, that gives you 
such great intel 100%. in terms of when are they shopping? When are they spending the exactly. most? When are they like mm -hmm. defaulting on their payments? What are their trends mm -hmm. on purchase? When does when do people start winter shopping actually? And when do they stop? Having dealt with them on a one-to-one -one basis, lots of them, and not just the retailers and grocers, they all have the same excuse around like, oh no no that's you know that data sits separately from that data and like everything's siloed and like we've got this this one customer view project we're working on but it's going to take five years to roll out and i just sort of like nod yeah. my head in like absolute <laughs> amazement that like you know literally one of the biggest retail groups we worked with we went there and we we're like so you want one like a single customer view how long is it going to take to pull all this data in and they were like five years i was like that is absolutely mind-blowing <laughs> like i don't understand <laughs> Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, having that silo data is, is always a barrier, but I think it's also an excuse. I think yeah. people have been using data for the longest time to send happy birthday messages. Uh, well, if, you're, <laughs> if, if you're lucky. I'm just going to end off with a very sort of more general question. Is like, are there any great books or podcasts that you've read recently? Don't have to be necessarily on customer centricity, but I'm assuming that it's, it's data and customer centricity so, are very close to your heart. So I'll tell you what, I'm obsessed with how I built this. So I don't yeah. know if you've ever heard the podcast, no. a weekly podcast, and mm -hmm. it's basically people who've started from very little, mm -hmm. um, always. Mm -hmm. And the best one is the Spanx one, if you've got time to listen oh, to it. Yeah. Um, but it's about entrepreneurs and how kind of how in the world do they even think about the idea and what did they do to shift their little idea, which usually started in their garage or the back of their house mm -hmm. into something that, you know, all of these companies that they interview are kind of more than billion dollar companies sure. um, today. And they've either sold or made decisions to retain. It's not necessarily about data, but it, it helps me think a little bit deeper about how are people thinking about these customer insights? How are they thinking about what the customer needs? Um, and how, you know, the podcast is amazing because it's about how relentless people are in their mm -hmm. vision. Mm -hmm. um, and I think I take two pieces of inspiration for that. Like one, Ubi's is a very operational business mm -hmm. and um, sometimes it takes a lot out of me and my team to make to make the magic happen that we do every day mm -hmm. happen. And so for, for me, it's a, it's a bit of inspiration on you keep cracking if you believe in what you're doing because you know you're doing something great. Um, and the second piece that is super clear is is you have to continue to innovate. Mm -hmm. um, it's impossible to be static in terms of your offering mm -hmm. and succeed long term in a, in a marketplace. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, that's why I particularly love it. From a book perspective, I've actually downloaded, I haven't read them, I'm, I'm on leave tonight, so I'm yeah. going to start reading it on the plane. But this was on the recommendation actually of somebody from Discovery who's, mm -hmm. who spent a lot of time getting deep into behavioral economics. Mm -hmm. um, and he recommended I download this book. Mm -hmm. The book is called Predictably Irrational. Mm, I've heard um, about it, apparently it's amazing. He's actually this guy, Dan Ariely, mm -hmm. has written... If you go on to Amazon, mm -hmm. a ton of books, mm -hmm. um, particularly as he starts to learn a little bit more about hu how humans behave. Mm -hmm. um, so, so I'm quite excited to read this one. Mm -hmm. The one that I really enjoyed was um, How Google Works. Yeah, also a great book. And that was just for me a piece around getting a deeper knowledge of how to motivate people a little bit better, mm -hmm. um, especially in this kind of industry. Mm -hmm. And then Shoe Dog by Phil Knight. Oh, Shoe Dog is a great book as well. Great entrepreneurial book about tenacity and yeah. gearing yourself to the facts and, and hoping it will work yeah, out. Exactly. Risk take of no. <laughs> I mean, if there's one thing I've learned about entrepreneurs, yeah. they're all a little bit cooked, to yeah. be honest. You've got to be slightly nuts. So you've got to put it all on the line. <laughs> Um, exactly. Okay, cool. Well, I really appreciate your time, um, especially on a day that you're flying out. Thanks again for your time, and I hope to see you in Joburg soon. Absolutely. Enjoy thank New York. It's my favorite city in the world, so I'm jealous. <laughs> Thanks so much. Okay, cool. Have Thanks. a great Have weekend. A great one. Yes. Bye. Bye. Thanks for listening. This has been Brad Elliott for Only Connect, a marklive.com podcast. If you've got any questions about data, AI, and customer centricity, please feel free to drop me an email at bradley at platinumc.com. Until next month, keep connecting.